Howdy y'all, welcome back. Today will be a quick video talking about resonance, more specifically discussing the nature of ancient bells. We will focus on the largest bells in the modern world, the bells which still exist today, as well as the ancient bells which have been documented but lost to time. Right off the bat, of note here is, and it's no secret, bells played a key role throughout the ages in shaping mankind. We find bells in nearly every city around the world, and in every single one of my Old World videos, we always have multiple towers that are showcasing these massive and beautiful bells. Not only were they a key component of spiritual guidance, as in religious bells, but we also have bells which rang to denote the changing of time. Before everyone had watches, or timekeepers, and those were the commonplace, we had bells to tell us when the hours were changing. In the most simplest terms, Bells could be both a percussion instrument and an identifier, but could there be even more to it than that? I've always been interested in understanding the true nature of bells in the old world, and more importantly, the frequencies or resonance that they can create. Commenters on my other videos have been quick to point out the possibility of bells being able to not only heal if set to a certain tone, but also able to destroy if set to a certain tone. It sounds like science fiction, but in modern times we have such inventions as sonic or supersonic weapons. These devices can be used to create sound waves so destructive that they can harm a target. These devices are also able to be easily hidden and manipulated, and oddly enough, there are multiple disclosed accounts of sonic devices being employed by governments around the world. Examples include infrared waves at 18.9, 0.3, and 9 Hz respectively which will cause a vibrating sensation and a possible loss of vision. We also have long wave acoustic devices, which create a cone of sound that can be aimed and used to deter or disable, as on the Seaborne Spirit, which used this type of device to deter pirates who were approaching their vessel. A similar device, known as the Mosquito, is available worldwide, but used primarily in the United Kingdom. Now, do you remember as a kid being told that children can hear sounds that adults cannot? Well, that's basically what the mosquito does. It plays a high frequency sound that apparently those roughly up to the age of 20 can hear. However, those older than 20 have a hard time hearing it and the elderly cannot hear this sound at all. It is used to deter these young people from lingering at stores in the United Kingdom. Honestly, I would not have believed this stuff unless I read it and to understand this is just a mere portion of the devices and inventions that have been disclosed to the public. Which brings me back to bells. The larger the bell, the more intricate the bell, the more range the bell could possibly have, depending on where the bell is struck. A larger bell could produce a wider range of sound waves or sonic waves, from a more peaceful healing frequency to possibly a more brutal or destructive frequency. Of note here, and you will notice this as we get into our list and I show you a couple photographs. The largest bells of all time, according to this list, were struck in the easternmost kingdoms of the world. The same kingdoms that we sometimes identify as Tartary or Tartarian. These seem to be the same locations in which these bells were created or founded. Now, tying this back to the current narrative mainstream, we have bells playing a key role in the ancient religions of the East. Mostly all Buddhist temples would incorporate a system of bells into their construction. And we can see this idea being sampled into other major religions of the ancient East as well. Seeing as most bells on this list had elaborate temples constructed around them, we begin to notice that these bells themselves could have possibly been monuments that were left over from the unified dynasty, which seemed to rule over much of the east at one point or another. For the most part, the ancient bells of the east seem to be rarely rung, at least when Europeans visited and first documented these amazing objects. It is as if the bells themselves had already served their purpose and were now more enshrined than put to use which is in direct opposition of how the later bells would be used in the Roman Catholic Empire. And even into more modern times, the bells within the towers in America were also being rung all the time. I grew up living next to a Presbyterian church that would ring its bells every hour. So why were these ancient bells of the Far East built so large and often 
not put to use, yet they were still enshrined in these massive temples. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below, but now, let us dive into this list discussing a couple of these very ancient, very massive bells. First, and possibly most revealing, is the Tsar Bell in the Kremlin, Moscow, Russia. The Tsar Bell stands over 20 feet tall, 22 feet in diameter, and currently weighs 445,166 pounds, making it the largest bell still in existence. But this comes with a catch. Even after the Tsar Bell was cast in 1735, what a time to be alive, the bell was never actually rung. I'll try to keep this brief, but listen to this absolutely bonkers history. First, we are told that Russians did not ring bells when they attended church, but instead rang bells as a warning or to announce an important arrival. We are told the first Tsar bell was completed in the year 1600 at a weight of 40,000 pounds. It stood in the original Ivan the Great bell tower but the tower caught fire in the mid-1600s and the bell fell to the earth and shattered. Then, using the remnants of the 40,000 pound bell, somehow a 220,000 pound bell was produced in 1655 known as the second Tsar bell. But this also was destroyed by fire, this time in the year 1701. After a short amount of time and when Anna becomes empress, she orders a new bell to be cast using the destroyed second Tsar bell, and she orders it to be even larger by 100,000 pounds. However, no one in Europe took her seriously, as no one in Europe had ever heard of anyone creating a bell of that size before. Empress Anna then employs local Russian help to create the bell. Now here is where things get really interesting. To create this Tsar Bell, the third Tsar Bell, the locals dig a 33 foot deep pit. They line the walls with clay and they reinforce it with packed earth. Empress Anna then adds 1,157 pounds of silver and 159 pounds of gold to the mixture. The bell is cast within this pit the first time, it is unsuccessful in 1734. However, the second time the bell is cast successfully on the date of November 25th, 1735. Now, I know my interpretation of this is probably wrong, but the exact quote in the narrative is, and I quote, Ornaments were added as the bell was cooling while raised above the casting pit through 1737, end quote. This to me, somehow, implies that the bell was cooling for over a year and still somewhat malleable. For this reason alone, we are told the Tsar bell never left the pit. Even when it was being ornamented, it was simply hanging above the pit. When another fire broke out in the Kremlin in May 1737, the guards decided to be proactive and throw water on the bell to help protect it. A big mistake. According to this narrative, because the bell was still cooling, the water being thrown on the bell caused massive cracks within the Tsar bell, 11 in total, as well as causing a very large portion, roughly 23,000 pounds, to break off of the bell. The entire bell then broke loose from its supports and went crashing down into the very pit in which it was forged. Attempts were made to remove the bell, however, no one could do it. I wish I was joking when I said this, but we're told that engineers, architects, and noblemen from far and wide would come to Russia to try to remove the Tsar bell from its pit, but no one could succeed. 
From 1737 onward, the bell sat sunken into this pit. A team of experts attempted to remove the bell in 1792 unsuccessfully. In 1819, and this part really dumbfounded me, Napoleon Bonaparte, during his occupation of Russia, deviated from plans and decided to dedicate large forces to the removal of the Tsar Bell. Even with all his military triumphs and his massive sources, apparently Napoleon could not remove the Tsar Bell from its pit. Then, in 1863, a French architect by the name of Auguste de Montferrand devised a plan to remove the earth surrounding the bell and was able to finally remove the Tsar Bell from the pit over a century after the bell was originally cast. Astoundingly, the Tsar Bell, which was never rung, is approximately three times larger than the next largest bell that is in use today for full circle ringing, which is the tenor bell in Liverpool Cathedral. For many decades, following the Tsar Bell's removal from the pit, the Tsar Bell itself, the massive structure, was used as a church, with the broken section serving as the entrance and exit door. Imagine that. What's interesting is, all throughout the Far East, we have these massive one-off bells being created, not part of any harmonious chain of ringing, but instead mysteriously cast at an immense size and built into temples and pagodas to serve these rulers in the East. With a focus on that, I'd like to briefly discuss the largest bell ever cast in the history of the world. A bell that may still exist today, although possibly in pieces at the bottom of a watery floor. This bell is considered lost because no one has ever been able to recover it, and in modern times, we have yet to determine its exact location. Seeing as this specific bell weighed well over half a million pounds, it's no surprise that this bell may have been entirely submerged into the river bed and through centuries could have become buried even deeper, only heightening this mystery. I'm talking about the Great Bell of Damazadi. A brief description of the Great Bell of Damazadi reveals to us that the bell was roughly 655,000 pounds. It was cast on February the 5th, 1484, by order of King Damazedi of Hathawadi Pagu for the Shandago Pagoda of Dagon in present-day Yangon, Myanmar. According to ancient accounts, the bell was cast out of 294 tons of metal, including various precious metals. The bell included silver, gold, copper, and tin. The bell was apparently very massive, and the description will depend on your understanding of the measurement of a cubit. We are told today that a cubit is roughly 18 inches, and the great bell of Damazedi was roughly 12 cubits high by 12 cubits wide, or approximately 18 feet by 18 feet. However, by the weight given, we can estimate that this bell could have been much larger. We also have the account of Gasparo Balbi, one of the travelers to see the bell in the year of 1583. According to Balby, the bell was much more ancient than European historians had given it credit for, and the bell itself was covered in a writing, a specific language which Balby had never seen before. When he asked the locals what the bell said and what language it was written in, he was told no one in the local area could decipher it. The Damazetti bell reached a rather inauspicious end. In the late 1500s, Felipe de Brito y Nicote, a highly dangerous Portuguese warlord, reached the coasts of what is now Myanmar, formerly Burma. In 1599, de Brito sacked Lower Burma, and by 1600, he established the Portuguese there. By 1603, he had declared independence from all local rule, and by 1608, he had discovered and decided to destroy the Damazetti Bell to create the world's largest cannon. De Brito was able to detach the bell from the pagoda. He rolled it down a hill with his troops and onto a small raft, which would be pulled into deeper waters by a team of elephants. 
and then it would be loaded onto a larger boat for transport. However, the massive Damazetti Bell proved too much for the ancient boats, and at a conflux of the Yangon and Bagu rivers, known as Monkey Point, the ship containing the bell collapsed and sank to the bottom with the bell taking a few of the boats with it. The bell was never recovered. De Brito and his forces were then overthrown in 1613 and De Brito was impaled on a wooden stake. Throughout the ages, multiple attempts have been undertaken to try and recover the Damazetti Bell from deep in the riverbed. However, all of these attempts have proven to be unsuccessful, even into modern times. With more modern technology, you would think we would at least be able to locate this Damazetti Bell. However, even locating the bell has become rather difficult. To this day, we still do not know with certainty exactly in the riverbed where the Damazetti Bell lies. But I think I'm going to wrap up the video there. I wanted to give a big shout out to this month's contributors to the channel. We have Logan Roth, Scout Wynn, Jose Corral, William Steiner, Richard Fisk, Michael Crutchley, Aaron Klein, Joanne Roseanne, Lisa Combs, and Nick Miller. Thank you all so much for helping my channel to grow. To anyone else, you can contribute to the channel here. In conclusion, I just wanted to ask, what do you think about the ancient bells? Do you believe they had more of a purpose than the current narrative gives them credit for? And could the ancient bells of the East actually have a much deeper history and connection to the old world than we have discussed today? What do you think specifically about the Tsar Bell and the Damazetti Bell? I'd love to hear your thoughts and your comments down below, and I look forward to chatting with you on the next video. Cheers.